Good morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, December 8th. And as promised, it's me, Joanne Coons, and I'm here with my partner, Jackie Durham, uh, the guru of all things contractual. Um, and we wanted to talk to you today about considerations for your contracts if you're participating in a for sale by owner real estate transaction. Um, this customarily comes up in the context of residential uh, closings in terms of people buying and selling homes. I will say, um, you know, with the popularity of HGTV, lots of things people um, perceive that they can do on their own now, and you certainly can do for sale by owner. Um, it's, but our, but our real estate agent friends um, will always lament uh, that, you know, their familiarity with the process does bring some experience to the table. And so you need to be mindful of how to run your transaction if you don't have the benefit of a real estate agent by your side. Um, also know that you can list yourself, you can list your home for sale by owner and the buyer could have a realtor. Um, and that puts the seller in a little bit different position as well. So we're gonna touch on procedural, like practical considerations as well as contract provisions when it comes to um, participating in these transactions because we see the good, the bad and the ugly. So. Um, it's nice to save the expense, um, but sometimes we make up for it in other ways that we may not realize. So um, you can't just say realtor commission is typically 6% and that will go to zero uh, because you will have some different costs. Um, and that starts sometimes to change people's position on whether or not they wish to proceed without the benefit of a professional. So let's dive in. I'm sure uh, Jackie's salivating with a list. <laughs> As usual, um, I, have, but we, I have my list. <laughs> he has a list as always. Um, keep in mind as well, folks, that we'll happily take your questions. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you're have, welcome to enter any questions as you go and we will get, get those answered as well. So without further ado, what's up first, Jack? Um, so what's up first, I would say is with any contract, as we always say, and we're beating this horse again, is that you definitely need your attorney to review it. So uh, regardless of whether it's a standard FAR bar realtor contract or one that uh, has been prepared by one of the parties or their attorneys, it's really, really important to make sure that you have an attorney review that, um, which we're about to get into the, the numerous contract provisions and considerations that have to take place. Um, I would also say that whenever you have a uh, for sale by owner situation or really a, a contract where one party is represented by an agent and not the other, it, you're going to probably be leaning a little bit more on your attorney for questions regarding inspections and appraisals. And you're gonna be doing a lot more legwork and the coordinating of different things like that, the walkthrough and the inspection. So I do agree with Joanne that you may be saving on the expense of an agent, but I do feel that the extra billable hours that you spend with your attorney may, may uh, offset that, those savings to a certain extent. Um, but it's, it's really important, I think, if you're going to go that route, to go through and try to nail down as many terms as you can on the front end with the other party before you bring it to your attorney. Yeah. But under no circumstances should you ink anything before you have your attorney review it. But um, we were hoping to give you guys some tips about, okay, think about X, Y, and Z before you bring it to your attorney, because that might save you some, some attorney's fees and time. So it's, it's true. And let me just jump in there where you said, have your attorney review. Keep in mind as well, there is a, an attorney review provision that you can put into the contract and people like to do that. I don't love when people do that because you've already said whatever you were going to say that I'm going to disagree with. And that it's very obvious that I've come in and made a change to the deposit amount or whatever the, it's not typically the language even that necessarily needs to be changed if folks have pulled a far bar contract off of the internet or something. So it's really not the language that's an issue, it's the customary terms. And I had this issue last week with, um, with somebody, they typically use a real estate agent, uh, you know, and sometimes I don't wanna knock for sale by owners, sometimes, you know, you, your friend wants to buy it or your tenant wants to buy it. And there, it, it makes sense to not have it listed, um, but you also, still don't know the process necessarily. So we have to be cautious there. Um, but sometimes it does make sense that there's a private party sale, but keep in mind that once you've put the terms out there, you can't put them back in the genie bottle. And I had this lady on the phone last week and she said, 
you know, can you help? My real, my realtor said you were great. And I said, absolutely. There's a list of terms that we want you to go get from your buyer. And then we'll, you know, she says, can you prepare the contract? Absolutely. I can prepare the contract, the seller's disclosure statement, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, oh my gosh, that fee's outrageous. And I was like, do you want to do it? I mean, it's, there is a fee to do to prepare these contracts and after she got done complaining about the fee i sent her the list of terms that we needed and then she came back and was like well how long is normal for a financing contingency how long is normal for the inspection contingency i was like this is what you're paying for it's not just the words on the paper it's the experience and the um information the guidance to say oh that's oh 10 days that's crazy that's not enough or that's too much um, it's, you know, and, and I can't point that out enough because, you know, especially with the popularity of um, Google University, you know, we don't need professionals for anything in the whole world. You can diagnose yourself um, with anything from a headache to a brain tumor. Um, so why have anybody go to school? But uh, it's easy when you're looking at those numbers to go, oh, I'll just save. And then these are the things that quickly she wrote the check because she was like, okay, I get it now. So um that's the end of that's i'll try not to tirade about that again well you're right though that there are there are some very fine distinctions that can be made in a contract even just one word can make a, a huge difference um and i'll get to one of those items later um but that's why it's really important to make sure that you're crafting this based on your particular circumstances mm -hmm. and you have to communicate that to your attorney and the contract can look very, very different based upon this, your particular circumstances. And what was appropriate for one of your previous transactions may not now be appropriate for this transaction. So reusing an old contract um, mm -hmm. or hopping on legal Zoom um, can be very, very dangerous. And to echo what Joanne said about the attorney review provision, I, I do hate that provision <laughs> because Customarily, um, it not it does provide us five days to look at the contract, um, but it's not typically crafted in a way where we can alter material terms. So you're already pregnant with the terms of that contract. I can only correct deficiencies in how those clauses are written. There's a big difference there. Yeah. So you can't change the material terms typically in how those are written. So I, I agree with you. I'm not a huge fan of those. Um, but just to kind of dive into the contract itself and maybe some um, some points that you should definitely hit on with the other party to the contract to make sure you guys are on the same page. Um, we'll start first and foremost with the deposit. Um, the seller obviously is going to want some kind of deposit. Uh, they want the buyer to have some skin in the game mm -hmm. and you're going to need to be on the same page about that. As a seller, you're obviously going to want a larger deposit because it will secure the performance of the buyer's obligations that much tighter. Uh, but as the buyer, as we've mentioned in previous webinars, you're gonna wanna keep that deposit down as much as you can, because in the event of a dispute, even if you are legally entitled to that deposit, if the seller gives you a hard time, now you are in a position where you can't just pull that out. Um, you know, the escrow agent, whoever is, is holding the deposit is going to need the seller's release as well. So the seller can really have some fun with you if they want to. Um, unfortunately. So that's a really important provision to make sure that when you're negotiating this transaction, you guys are on the same page about the deposit first and foremost, because um, that can also kill a deal. Um, the other uh, item I wanted to mention is the description of the property. I can't tell you how many contracts I've received where the description of the property is conflicting. We'll have one parcel ID for one property and the, the mailing address does not match up. Um, one of the quickest ways to render a contract unenforceable is to not have a proper description of what's being sold. And that also goes to the personal property that's going to be conveyed. Uh, especially recently, Joanne and I have witnessed numerous disputes involving what actually conveys with the property. It's really important to, to confirm what's conveying with the property in terms of furniture, fixtures, uh, appliances, all of that. But it's equally important to confirm what is not conveying with the property because there's a lot of fuzziness around what is deemed a fixture. Mm -hmm. um, we encountered a recent transaction recently where you, the, the mount for a projector was considered a fixture, but the buyer's attorney was also claiming that the projector attached to the mount was considered a part of the fixture. Now, there are, you know, people can have whatever opinion they want, but to avoid that kind of dispute mm -hmm. and disagreement, if you're crystal clear in the contract exactly what is not conveying, then you can avoid a dispute like that. Um, 
So do you have any other horror stories? <laughs> Personal oh, how, property how, long, how long will you give me? I, I had know. one. I had one <laughs> on uh, a condo on Longboat Key and the buyers and sellers were not getting along. And uh, there was a dispute over a Murphy bed and whether the Murphy bed was a fixture or not. And so the seller's attorney told the seller that they had to leave the Murphy bed, but that they could take the mattress. I promise you that mattress is in a dumpster. They did not need, they're, you know, they're not even the same size as a regular mattress. So um, if, if I will just say, if you are the seller for sale by owner seller, and you intend to take something with you that you have to remove from the wall in any way, shape or form, uh, you need to specify that in the contract. If you are the buyer and there's anything that you love, oh my God, that light fixture, you better make sure that that is in the contract to go. Just like Jackie said, a, a, an ounce of prevention is way more than the, than the pound of cure. And lots of times people say, well, I'm, you know, I'm right. And that's just the principle, but principles are not only pricey, principles are painful to chase after. So let's just get it clarified up front. And again, you know, I'm not a realtor. I don't have any interest in, in being a realtor. Um, but this is where people do say, um, you know, oh, they just unlock the door. These are the exact kind of situations where a realtor would be able to guide you even before you got to the lawyer um, to be like, mm, I heard when I listed the property for you, how much you love that light or your grandfather gave it to you, or this is real meaningful. And we're going to make sure that that gets carved out. You want to, you, we absolutely want to make sure that those things are crystal clear, especially if they're sentimental value, even more so than a tangible value. Right. Exactly. Exactly. At least if there's so, a tangible value, you can say, here's 500 bucks. Sorry about the light or sorry about the washer and dryer or sorry about the garage refrigerators are another, you know, <laughs> source of, of pain where, or extra ice makers, anything like that. Like people expect refrigerator, stove, microwave, dishwasher, but if there are additional appliances, either in the in outdoor kitchen or in the garage, uh, those are things you want to pay particular attention to because those are always what people are fighting about. And right. very seldom are they expensive. It's just, then they, oh, well, you can't take that. And it's like, you didn't even know that you wanted it. <laughs> right, right. I didn't, I didn't like it so much until I saw my, until, you you know, it. <laughs> until he wanted it. Right. So um, we're, we're going back to preschool. Um, so yeah. And, and another thing I think is really important that's overlooked in some of these for sale by owner contracts that don't make it to me before they're inked is the financing provision. I know that I've seen a number of these contracts with a one-liner talking about that the, the contract is contingent upon uh, the loan approval being obtained by the buyer. As a buyer, that is very, very dangerous for you. You need to make sure that the terms and what is defined to be loan approval is very clear in terms of the interest rate, the term, the amortization, points that you have to pay at closing, and also including any kind of conditions to the loan approval that um, you are not comfortable with. So you, you need to include as much detail as possible so that what is deemed to be loan approval is something that you will actually be comfortable with. Because if you don't include that, if that detail is not there, then you can find yourself in a position where you have received a loan commitment, but it includes terms and conditions that you're not necessarily comfortable with. Uh, that's not gonna give you the basis if you have a very general um, loan contingency clause, that's not gonna give you the basis to terminate the contract and your deposit is now at risk. Likewise, a seller, it's equally important for you to craft a careful uh, loan contingency clause because you need to make sure that you are protecting yourself from the standpoint that the buyer has an obligation to exercise good faith in pursuing that loan, uh, that you reserve the right to receive written confirmation of any kind of loan approval or disapproval so that you can actually have a, a way to verify that the buyer has exercised good faith. Because mm -hmm. without that, a buyer could strategically default on their loan application and not supply something that's required for the loan approval if they want to wiggle out of the contract that way. So if you really want to protect your right to take that deposit, should the buyer um, you know, change their mind, you need to make sure that you have a basis upon which to verify that they have not exercised that good faith that they need to. Um, so I see that happen a lot where, where, you know, the buyer says, oh, I didn't get the approval and the, the seller is without a, a way to verify that that's actually the case and, and what led to that loan disapproval. So, and keep in mind too, there's part of that provision is not only to get the approval, but to 
share it. And that's another thing that a realtor would typically be monitoring is, hey, if, you have, if you're the seller, where's that buyer's approval letter? If not, do we wanna cancel the contract and drop them? Um, if you're the buyer, hey, make sure that you don't get canceled and dropped because you failed. You, if you have never done this, you may not know that it's not only important to get it, but to share that approval and what an approval looks like. If you're the seller and they hand you a conditional approval that says they still have to provide financial statements and tax returns, then that approval is not, it doesn't meet the terms of loan approval and you could cancel the contract and go get a different buyer. So again, if, if you're doing this, you've got to make sure that you're paying attention as you go because these are places where big problems can happen or if something's not going well it's an opportunity to cut the contract and get out with somebody that is real right right and and that's you know i've, I've mentioned before in the context of other transactions um uh, that we've done webinars on like business transactions that if i'm representing the buyer i like to make sure that we also include a provision that the closing is contingent upon final loan approval Mm -hmm. Because what can also happen is you, uh, a buyer may get what otherwise qualifies as loan approval because they get a loan commitment, the appraisal passes, everything is going good, then one of the spouses gets laid off or their compensation gets uh, reduced for whatever reason. And by no fault of their own, the loan approval is pulled at the 11th hour. Now their deposit is at risk because they technically have received that loan approval, but they can't proceed with the closing. So. Mm -hmm. That's why I like to include that um, in my contracts. That doesn't always fly with the seller, but that's you know even more importantly why you and your attorney need to take a very close look at that provision, whether you are the buyer or the seller. Um, it's really important. The um, <clears throat> one of the other items that I would like to touch on because I've seen this slip into contracts more often than uh, than I would expect, and that is the distinction between marketable title and insurable title. A lot of attorneys, especially if they're representing the seller, will provide for um, insurable title to be conveyed to the buyer. And there's a big difference between marketable title and insurable title. So marketable title is basically title to the real estate that is free from any title defects. And a title defect is, you know, uh, an encumbrance or a violation of a condition or restriction which affects the marketable value of the property that can create problems for a buyer after they've purchased the property while they're owning it. And it can also cause problems for them when they turn around to go and sell the property. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure as a buyer that you are contracting to receive marketable title and not insurable title. The difference is with insurable title, if that's what you've contracted for, so long as there is a title agent who is willing to insure the property and issue a title insurance policy, that standard has been met. Mm -hmm. And you might find title agents who are willing to insure over title defects. And I have seen it myself. Uh, what they essentially do is accept that title defect from coverage under the title insurance policy. And that can create a huge issue because you might have a glaring title defect, mm -hmm. such as an encroachment into a setback or some, or an easement or a violation of a covenant or restriction. And if you have a title agent who is still willing to insure over that title defect by way of an endorsement or by way of accepting it from coverage, now you are contractually required to complete the closing even though there's this title defect and you right. may not have the ability to make an objection to that. Uh, in which case, if you proceed with the closing, you could run into issues when you go to sell that property down the line to another buyer because most buyers, especially those who are represented by attorneys, are going to require marketable title. Mm -hmm. So. You'll have a problem with resale um, and you might even have a problem while you're holding the property or you, if you decide to pull out of the contract, your, your deposit will definitely be at risk. So that is an example of the fine distinctions that we're talking about where one word can make a huge difference um, in what your rights are as a buyer under the contract. And not only is it one word, it's one really unfamiliar word. So if you're mm -hmm. Joe Schmo on the street, that like that's those, either of those sound legal beagley so it's like okay well yeah and marketable titles great insurable titles great well they don't really even necessarily appreciate what that means um and this can happen when people don't even realize it so we had a transaction last week where um the seller bought the property paid cash did not get a survey so when we were turning around and doing the sale i always encouraged my buyers to get a survey we got a survey we identified a setback issue 
and the seller had no idea it existed because they didn't have a survey. So this was a problem when they bought it, they just were unaware of it. Um, so this isn't, you know, people, people think these things don't come up and they do with some frequency. It's not every transaction, um, but the problem with title issues is they're infrequent, but very expensive typically to fix, either expensive to fix or they can impact the value of the property or the ability to sell it, which drives down the price if it's difficult to sell. Um, so these things are not in your face. What people are very good at looking at is the home inspection and what kind of condition, you know, is the air conditioner in? And those things are important too, but you've got to think that the same thing exists on the boring side or the paperwork side um, that you don't see. Just like you may not see mold unless you have an inspection. You may not see the, the title defects unless we have a survey and do a proper inspection of those things. So. Yeah, we're just and, on the other side. It's the same. We're examining, you know, the, the legalities of the transaction as opposed to the functionality of the property. And I, I also feel that that people assume that because the seller closed with an attorney when they purchased and got a title policy, that it's got to be clean. Almost as if the 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 process upon which the the seller obtained the property squeaked it clean of any kind of title defects because we already had an attorney's eyes on this before. And I can't tell you how many times we have stumbled into title defects that have been missed by other attorneys in previous transactions. And we've, I mean, we had one particular transaction, it was commercial, um, where there were some serious defects with the prior deeds that went unnoticed for decades. And that is still a, a, a title defect that can affect the marketability of your property. And, you know, the measures that you have to take yep. to rectify those can be very expensive, such as quiet title actions, hunting down heirs, things like that. That's why, um, you know, another point I was going to make here is it's so important to make sure that even if you're just dealing with your best friend and you guys are, you know, you're selling your property to your best friend or your neighbor, Bob, it doesn't matter. You really need to make sure that you are contracting for a title insurance policy yep. to be issued by a, a, a title agent and preferably a an attorney. So that's this is a perfect example of why it's so important to have title insurance and why a buyer should require it under the contract. Because yes, everyone says, oh, well, isn't the seller providing warranties under, under the deed? Yes, under a warranty deed and to a certain extent under a special warranty deed, the seller is going to be warranting that they have legal valid title free of encumbrances. And yes, I promise to defend you buyer should you run into any issues. If the seller deceases, if the seller moves to Alaska, if you are just otherwise unable to find them, you're going to have an issue. And, and, and going, having the seller fight that fight for you is going to be a lot more difficult than contacting your title insurance company who does nothing but resolve these issues for, mm -hmm. for buyers. So that's another, you know, that segued perfectly into what I was going to say about the warranty deed and special warranty deed. I would, would highly recommend that any buyer require a warranty deed, not a special warranty deed. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, typically that's what your title insurance company is going to require anyways. So yeah. that's another item to make sure you're paying close attention to when you're in discussion. Uh, the other item I would mention is the contracts. And, and I feel like this is another, uh, another clause that gets overlooked with some regularity. The contract typically discusses what the buyer is going to take title subject to. And that's typ typically uh, public utility easements, existing public utility easements, or platted, public util or platted utility easements, um, and restrictions that are, are common to the subdivision that the property falls in. But sometimes, if you have uh, you know, the seller's attorney drafting the contract, the description of what the buyer is taking title subject to is much more general. And it might say something like existing easements and existing restrictions and things like that. The reason why that is problematic is because when you're signing the contract, you haven't run your title search yet. You don't know what's gonna come back on title and what weird private easements or uncustomary restrictions might be lurking out there. So you as a buyer wanna make sure that you're being very crystal clear about what you're going to accept title subject to. Um, so that's another one that I've seen cause some issues. And, you know, if you agree to sub take title subject to what's out there already, if you don't like what's out there, now you're stuck. Mm -hmm. So, and this um, comes up a lot when people are trying to avoid the cost of 
either the realtor or the lawyer and they just grab a contract out of nowhere and you know people don't want to read every word of anything even an email let alone a contract and you would not you would not believe how much people are willing to spend six figures on a property and not have read the contract so um it's very easy to be like well we pulled this off the internet and it's it's fine we're filling in the terms we care about price closing date deposit amount and the rest of it is just you know legalese. Legalese. <laughs> do we really have to worry about that mm, yeah. i know i know it's all well, fine until it's not fine exactly exactly and, it, and it's it's important not only to address these particulars but also the manner in which you're going to address a title defect should it arise because it will it they arise more often than you think like joanne said mm -hmm. and you need to make sure you have a set procedure in place about how they will be addressed um, because that can also cause problems the title defect doesn't necessarily have to kill the deal oftentimes mm -hmm. there's a fix we just need an exception or a variance or you know whatever the issue is we oftentimes they're easy to fix um but you just got to know about them yeah exactly exactly now something a, a provision that i feel like a lot of parties pay close attention to like you were saying joanne because they're very interested in the physical condition of the property and that is the inspection provision and if you have for instance an as-is contract the buyer is going to basically have a lot of latitude to to do their inspection and terminate for any reason um, if they're not happy with the property for whatever reason uh, if you don't have an as-is contract and if you are a seller um, and you are obligating yourself to make certain repairs up to a certain repair limit amount uh, it's important to it's really important to make sure that you're comfortable with what you're contracting for because i feel like most sellers feel pretty confident about their property going into this and they don't think anything serious is going to come up. So they're like, yeah, I'll, I'll give them 3000 for this kind of repair and 2000 for this kind of repair. And lo and behold, the inspector comes back and they gobble up all of your um, in, in inspection limits and you end up having to stroke a check for in an amount that you were not expecting. And that eats into your bottom line and no seller's happy about that. So it's really important to make sure that you carefully consider what you're willing to invest into the repairs um, under that provision and that you take a close look at that. On the flip side, a seller also needs to consider the fact that, you know, many times in these, in, in, in the non as is contracts and the standard contracts that call for the repair limits, a seller's kind of looking to lock a buyer in saying, all right, you don't, you don't have the ability to terminate unless the repairs exceed this repair limit and i'm otherwise unwilling to cover the cost that's the only way that the buyer can pull out under those circumstances um the 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 way that you can also ensure that you're locking in the buyer is to you know to basically cover that additional expense so there's no reason it's, it's best to give yourself a little latitude and to keep those limits down um, you can pay more to cover the additional expense for the repairs if you choose to but you aren't obligated to so um, I would just keep that in mind. I've seen I've seen sellers get burned with those provisions. Um, and you know, the other thing about the inspection that people don't necessarily appreciate is if you are for sale by owner, you don't have the guidance of your realtor to say, hey, how are we gonna coordinate these inspections? And how many inspections are you gonna have? Are you gonna have a roofer? Are you gonna have a plumber? Are you gonna have a general home inspector? Do you want mold? Are we, you know, are we doing a termite inspection? And if so, are we going to line these people up all on the same day? Is the seller going to be there? Is the buyer going to be there? And you know, these are things that the parties don't even think about until it's like, well, now what do we do? I'm mm -hmm. I'm not going. I'm just closing it. So you know, it's it's those types of in engagements and involvements where people are like, I didn't even think about that. Like the seller doesn't know you really can try to make them line all those people up on one day or you know, in a reasonable amount of time, the seller shouldn't have to get out of his property nine times for nine separate ex, um, inspections and meet the people there and, and, and. And again, these are the conveniences that you're giving up when you opt to do this on your own. Plus meeting these people, you don't know what to say. Um, back to the financing provision too, just for one second, is meeting the appraiser. If your buyer's getting a loan and you've done for sale by owner, you have no idea how much work the realtor puts into preparing comps to provide to the appraiser and explaining 
if there's anything unusual about the number or the location or if you have a unique property, um, you know, to say, hey, you know, I know most larger properties are east of the interstate, but I'm west and here's why I'm different and don't compare me to this neighborhood and pull my number down. If you want exactly. to a raise and you want your number, then you got to be prepared to do that argument and meet the appraiser and give access and who's chasing to make sure that that report comes in. So. And don't you feel that it's also, it's, it's beneficial as well. And the agent, when you are using an agent, when agents are involved, the review and the advice that can be offered for the inspection report itself. I feel like there's a lot of discussion surrounding the items on the inspection report. And there's always a lot of questions. If you have an agent, they're going to better be able to guide you on that because they see them with some frequency. If you, you know, if you come to your attorney, they're going to be like, well, I don't know what that would cost with a contractor. Because this doesn't normally cross my path. I don't normally yeah. have to have to prepare the appraisal report or whatever. Um, one comment that we received was someone said a lot of the extra service that the realtor does is just project management. Um, getting, you know, getting under contract is really their job. And then getting them to closing is is kind of the part that people don't. I think people underestimate or underappreciate because um, there's a lot that goes into it. It's not, it's the same thing on our end, sign the contract as the start, not the finish, but the parties will say, oh, I bought a house yesterday. No, you signed a contract yesterday. You're not buying the house for 45 days or whatever. So um, now it's, the work begins. A, it's a process, not an event. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So it's important to, to make sure you're taking a close look at the, the terms of that inspection yeah. provision, but also, you know, make sure you're, uh, you're prepared to do a little legwork, um, you know, with your attorney or whoever is guiding you on that when the inspection actually takes place, because there's always inevitably discussion surrounding that. Now, there might be other contingencies um, that I wanted to address as well, such as the sale of, uh, sale of the buyer's home. You need to make sure that you're providing for that. If, you're, if you need to sell your home or a home in order to be able to fund this transaction, you need to make sure that that's baked into the contract and baked in well. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, if there's gonna be any kind of pre-occupancy or post-closing occupancy by the parties, we always recommend that this not be a one-liner. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's really important to have a, a solid post-occupancy agreement or pre-occupancy agreement, or if it's gonna be an extended period of time, a, a legit lease agreement. Um, because there's a lot more that goes into the expenses and repairs and you know you would be shocked what can happen in a 10 day period. So you want to protect yourself and make sure that you're addressing that properly in the contract or preferably by way of a separate agreement that is referenced and incorporated into the contract. Um, and another point I just want to note that a lot of parties overlook is that the kind of insurance coverage that you're going to carry as the owner of the property, um, if you are not actually occupying the property, is going to be different. So mm -hmm. your normal homeowner's policy is not, the scope of coverage is not going to be broad enough if you're going to have another person staying in your house, even temporarily. So you might want to talk to your agent about that and discuss what that's going to look like and what kind of endorsements or additional policies you can get to make sure that you're you're covered because a lot of people um, assume that their homeowner's policy is broad enough to cover that and and that's not always the case so and you should also notify the homeowner's insurance company that now you're not occupying the property and now you've got the buyer uh, or you know you're you've got the buyer moving in before the closing date so you're still the owner and now you basically have a tenant because if you don't notify the homeowner's insurance they and there's a claim they can say you told us you bought the contract saying you live there and now you don't and they can deny coverage that's their favorite thing to do is to right um and another another contingency uh joanne i want to mention is the appraisal contingency mm -hmm. so a lot of buyers think hey i'm getting a loan my lender is going to conduct an appraisal so i'm good not necessarily. If you are, if, if it's important to you that the property actually appraised for the purchase price, you do want to include a separate appraisal contingency because your lender can still approve financing even if the property doesn't appraise. They don't always, but they have, they're within the rights to do so. So um, I always recommend also the buyers include that contingency as well, and it, even if they are getting a loan. 
and in the um, financing provision, if you left blank the interest rate and loan amount and you were expecting to take a 90% loan and they approved you for 80, you contractually are still obligated to close mm -hmm. and just bring more money to, to the closing table, which you may not have been anticipating to do. But if you don't clarify that you have to get a 90% loan or this loan, loan is not approved, they'll approve you for 80, that's not approval. If you don't say, if that's blank, it says prevailing rate prevailing prevailing terms in the area which 80 percent is normal so mm -hmm. exactly the uh also, the be other careful I, if you're putting a big amount down if you're like oh i'm just getting a small loan well th there you go you don't get that appraisal the loan would still be approved um and you'd just be paying more than maybe the property's worth right right and speaking of expenses and costs um the closing costs and expenses that are customarily assumed by parties uh, in Sarasota and Manatee County, everyone's pretty much familiar with those, but I do also find that sometimes in these contracts, that's not even mentioned mm -hmm. because the parties just assume, oh, we're gonna proceed in accordance with local custom. Well, if it's not stated in the contract exactly how those closing costs are gonna be allocated, if you don't agree to that on the front end, you can get to the 11th hour where you're right on top of closing and a buyer and seller are very much in disagreement about who's paying the closing fee and for the uh, you know title policy and things like that. So it's- I will it's say when those, when buyers and sellers call me and have that initial consultation, hey, my tenant's gonna buy it, hey, my neighbor's gonna buy it. The first thing I ask is after price and closing date, how are we allocating the cost? And they're like, oh, we didn't talk about that. That is mm -hmm. not normally in that first conversation. They'll get there eventually, but that's not normally something that's been hammered out by the time people get to me. And they're like, oh, well, what are the costs and what costs, you know, how are they normally allocated? And, and so once we look at that, you know, a lot of times it, it's almost a 50, 50 split between what the buyer would normally pay and, and what the seller's going to pay in doc stamps. If you take commission out um, if they're, so sometimes people say just split it down the middle and um, and sometimes they want it split according to local custom usually when i provide the quote of the closing costs i outline like this is what the buyer normally pays this is what the seller normally pays um, but they haven't thought about doc stamps they haven't thought about um, title insurance or they certainly don't even know what an estoppel letter is or let alone how much it might be so and that's fine i'm not knocking them for not appreciating that it's just um that's they're more worried about price and closing date and deposit and inspection that's stuff they know to worry about this um you know you get deeper down and that's just they haven't crossed that bridge yet right and and keep in mind also that you might the other party to the contract might be coming from a different county yeah. where the allocations are customarily different um i i i know collier collier county they do things mm -hmm. slightly different um, and that's not too far away. So no. you might have someone coming from from further south and they're like, hey, we, you know, the buyer always pays the doc stamps. What are you talking about? Yeah. Um, you know, so it's it's just important to have that discussion ahead of time because, you know, it can it can shake out to be a, a little chunk of change. Um, the uh, the other items that I, I think are really important to note that are often overlooked whenever two parties are not using an agent are the required disclosures. Mm -hmm. So as a seller, you need to make sure that you're including a seller disclosure statement, which is basically a disclosure statement identifying your knowledge of items related to the condition of the property. And I would say that that, that extends not only to what you've witnessed since owning the property, but also what you have knowledge of going into the property. So if, if your seller provided you with a seller disclosure statement with certain information, I would venture to say that you need to you that's deemed knowledge on your part because you received it and it's constructive knowledge. So you need to make sure that you're providing that seller disclosure statement and that you're careful about how you prepare and, and provide that information. Um, as a buyer, I always recommend that we include that standard representation and warranty by the seller that provides that there are no uh, that they have no knowledge of any other information which is not otherwise disclosed that could have an effect on the value of the property. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm rep representing the seller, on the other hand, I want to pull that out, or at least I want to limit that language. Um, so, but it can, the way it's crafted, whether we add in material effect to the value of the property or omit that, that can have a, that can have a, a large effect on the obligation of the disclosing party, which is mm -hmm. the seller. 
So it's really important to take a look at that with your attorney and to know what that means for you. The, um, the other items are if the property is located in a homeowners association or a, a condo, you wanna make sure that those disclosure statements are provided with the contract and that you're also providing the required disclosure documents basically upon signing the contract because there are statutory periods that the buyer is entitled to cancel the contract. And if you wait until the end of the contract to provide those documents, um, you might be providing a basis for the buyer to wiggle out at the 11th hour. Mm -hmm. um, there's also you know, certain disclosures like radon gas, um, lead-based paint, if you have a house that was built before 1978. And then most importantly, I think, I think that this is a, a clause that causes some issues for folks, um, is the permit disclosure. So if I am representing the seller, I'm not gonna make any mention about anything to do with permits. However, if I'm representing the buyer, I'm going to want to include some kind of disclosure by the seller confirming that there are no open permits and that there has been no unpermitted work. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this is, and I've unfortunately personally experienced this, <laughs> if you purchase a home that has had unpermitted work performed, and you go to modify the home in any way, the county can basically require you to pull the required permit that the seller should have pulled 10 years ago to do that addition or to you know, redo their, their kitchen that they failed to pull. And now you're having to jump through a bunch of additional hoops, possibly make further and additional modifications than you had originally anticipated just to come into compliance with code. So, it's really important that not only a buyer takes the time to review the home and see, hmm, it looks like they did some work here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna check public record to make sure that they properly pulled the permit. Not just that they closed the permit, but that it was pulled in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and that you as the buyer have the option to terminate the contract if you do stumble into a bunch of unpermitted work that's gonna give you problems down the road. Um, because a lot of contracts either are silent to that or they don't require they don't provide the buyer a basis to terminate the contract if they do discover unpermitted work or open permits. So depending on who I represent, I'm very careful with that, yeah. with that provision. And, and, and we've seen it. I mean, I, I know you've, you've bumped into it and I certainly have bumped into it as well. And it's, it's a, uh, not only myself, but with clients and mm -hmm. that, um, you know, that can cause a lot of problems and expense to an unknowing buyer. So, yeah. and not that sellers are trying to be sneaky, you, you know, in some counties, you have to file a, a permit to hang a ceiling fan, which is absolutely ludicrous. Yeah. But technically, it's supposed to be permitted. So, well, and Anyways. a lot of times people are hiring the contractor and they believe that the contractor got the permit and they don't, you know, they trust and they didn't follow up with anything. It's like, mm, you just told me how great the kitchen was, but I don't see any permits for the kitchen. So, <laughs> yes. you know, frequently, I would say it's more often the case than not that the sellers didn't intentionally do the work with no permit. They just really don't know that the, that the professional that they hired didn't pull one. Not, oh, not always, but, but a lot of times. Well, I, I, I actually was, I'm, I'm doing a kitchen remodel myself and I've gone to several companies who were not interested in working with me because I wanted to do things. Because they've seen the and, webinars. <laughs> well, because yes, yes. Well, I, I, the second that you utter permits and things like that and you know I want to I want to see that you're I want the names of your subs and I want to make sure they're licensed and all that you know you spook a lot of people away so it's 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 you know you kind of have to do your homework <laughs> but that's I mean that I, I feel like those are some of the main points but yeah. I do want to go back and just say every transaction is unique um, and, and you really just, you have to make sure that after you iron out some of these important terms and discuss it with the other party, you just, you have to make sure that your attorney is reviewing the contract because yeah. there could be something you're overlooking and some goal that you think you're achieving by way of the, the contract that isn't written properly and yeah. um, could, could leave you disappointed in the end, so. Another practical consideration as we march to the end of the transaction is that people don't appreciate is the um, final walkthrough. Mm -hmm. um, and needing to be available for that. And oftentimes when we have these situations, people are working or uh, maybe they, maybe they're snowbirds or they're up North or whatever. And they said, well, I can't, I can't be there. Like who's going to do it then? It still needs to be done. The buyer's still entitled to that just because it's inconvenient for you. Keep in mind again, when you decided to save cost, um, that this is part of 
of of what you are up against um that you you you're required to give access for that and giving access is inconvenient so um it's it's not just dumping an mls at, and pay 500 bucks flat fee because you pay the 500 bucks for the exposure not for any of the project management that is my i'm going to seal that one um, project if, management is perfect because just if you don't mind the, Shirley, <laughs> you have to go hunt and gather uh you know the disclosure documents if you're in an yep. association i mean it's there's a lot there's a lot of legwork involved and a lot of people don't realize that so if you want to go that route absolutely more power to you but be prepared for some extra legwork and some extra legal fees because you're going to have more questions for your attorney because you're not going to have a trusty agent who um you know can kind of navigate you through the process absolutely absolutely every day if you are a for sale by owner buyer you also need to make sure that you're aware um to, to take a peek and see if you're looking at costs um to see hey was the seller does the seller have this homesteaded and is that why the tax bill is is where it's at um how long has it been their homestead there is a three percent save our homes cap that will continue to keep that tax rate low if it was their homestead and you can't say well they're paying three thousand so i'm going to pay three thousand it doesn't it doesn't necessarily work that way um we have a question with respect to homestead issue exemption issues if you're selling your primary residence um like i said it depends that not only do you get the fifty thousand dollars off the tax assessed value um but you also are going to get that save our homes cap for so the maximum that the taxes can increase each year is only three percent so if it's been their homestead for 30, 40 years, their taxes are gonna be really low and you are not going to um, be able to budget based upon that number. Um, if you are looking at something that was not homesteaded, you can't necessarily say, well, this is their number and so mine will be less. There's going to be a new assessment value based partially on your sale, um, but not entirely come the next year when the tax assessment comes out. And that will be your new baseline. Your fifty thousand dollars for homestead will come off of that. Your three percent cap will start there. So you have to be very cautious when you are trying to estimate what you anticipate your um, taxes will be on the property once you own it. Another thing that comes up that people don't appreciate is if you have a military disabled military veteran, they may have zero tax liability. So when it comes time for prorations you're gonna get zero because they owe zero um, and you're gonna owe the full balance um, the following year. So, um, you know, that's, those are just things that people don't necessarily even appreciate or out there. Um, we do have a question with respect to a multi-unit. So if you live in a multi-unit, Homestead is applied to your unit and not to the others. Um, so the buyer's gonna have to be cognizant of that in terms of the seller what you will transport to the new primary residence um, would be the part that's applicable only to your homestead unit so those are broken down and have their own individual values um, we have a question that says are there any risks in selling or buying a home that has recently had a quit claim deed in its history oh boy Oof. um so it depends like good lawyer answer um, mostly it depends on who prepared that quick claim deed. I had a closing last year where a husband and wife divorced maybe five or six years ago and they did their own quick claim deed because they did their own divorce and it was an incredibly acrimonious divorce and the former wife had moved to Australia. I pull the title search, I'm preparing for closing and that's one of the things that we review is the chain of title to make sure that it's gone from person A to B to C to your seller properly. Well, the quick claim deeds are frequently executed improperly or drafted improperly. People leave off marital statuses. They put the address and not the legal description. They don't have enough witnesses. It's not notarized properly. There is, I mean, that's a whole nother webinar on the crazy things we see that are quick claim deeds. Um, sometimes they're called quick claim deeds as though they're in a hurry. That's also inaccurate. They are not in a hurry. <laughs> um, but and the issue is like this gentleman had to then find the ex-wife and pay her $5,000 to get her to re-execute a new quick claim deed properly so that he could sell the property. And she had him. I mean, there was no other, like, we are dead in the water. We cannot close without that being remedied. So he had to, he had to do something. So it's not necessarily that the quick claim deed in the chain 
is problematic, it's that they're frequently incorrect. It doesn't jeopardize, if it's properly executed, it's not jeopardizing your ability to buy it as a buyer um, if, as long as they were properly executed. You don't want to take title under a quick claim deed. You would not be able to get title insurance on that. Um, and, and you're not, you're, you know, you're, the old law school adage is I can quick claim you my interest in Central Park, but I don't have one. So you get, exactly. not, you get whatever the seller has to give. Um, but there's no promises that they have anything to give. So you wouldn't want to pay anybody any money and take a quick claim deed. But normal proper reasons that we see quick claim deeds are when people go back and forth from their individual name to a trust or to an LLC. Um, frequently folks will use a quick claim deed for those purposes. So I wouldn't run like this is a bad property just because you no. see it. Um, but what, what you have to have your the hair up on your neck about is did they do it correctly? Exactly, exactly. And there are, um, this actually brings me back to a point I want to make about the, the title cure provision that we mentioned earlier that needs to be kind of examined. And, you know, you need to make sure that you have some kind of procedure for how a title defect will be cured by your seller. If you're the seller, you want to make sure that what's required of you to cure that title defect is also drafted carefully. Mm -hmm because I've seen contracts where the seller is required not only to use diligent effort, but is even required to bring legal action to cure a title defect. So to your point, Joanne, the, the gentleman who had to pay his ex-wife five grand just for, to get her signature on a, a corrective deed, you may not, you know, as a seller, you may not be willing to spend what it would take to hire an attorney and litigate and do whatever is necessary to technically cure that title defect. But if you sign a contract promising that you will, you know, you can find yourself in, in a bit of trouble there. So that's yeah. another fine distinction that, you know, another reason why that clause also really needs to be carefully examined by your attorney. It's so true. It's, so, you know, and, and I think when it comes to you know, people are accustomed to boilerplate contracts. They sign their car lease or their car loan. They sign rental agreements. They, you know, frequently stuff shove it under your nose and it's just sign here. Apple does it to you on the computer. Like click here, I agree. You have no idea what you've agreed to. You assume it's fine. And unfortunately people proceed that way oftentimes with business documents, real estate documents. And just like, ah, it's, it's, these things happen all the time. So therefore they're fine. The boilerplate is a baseline to start from, but it's certainly not customized to your circumstances. So you want to be cognizant that if there's, you know, anything, a nuance to your transaction that you've got that covered because it's, it's not always, it's not always as straightforward as it seems. The other wrinkle that we see are with, you know, when folks are trying to buy from an estate, if someone's passed away, there can be um, different requirements for, for that. And do you want to hang in there? while they finish the probate if you're the buyer or do you want the ability to get out and we see a lot of that come up as for sale by owner um lots of times when there's an estate folks will list that on craigslist so we do see um you know a lot of that where people get together and um and they and they go oh well i didn't i didn't know about that i didn't know about that and you know the people selling maybe have never even been to the property so they don't know anything it's great aunt velma they live in connecticut they've never even been to sarasota let alone know what kind of condition the property was in so <clears throat> we have one last question it says when using the as is contract can you confirm that the seller has no responsibility to cure title issues just help in the process that's going to be how you craft it that's why it's very important that you make sure that the title cure provision does not require you. I battled over this in a recent contract I was revising. I'm like, no, I'm my, my seller is not going to be required to use diligent effort or to uh, take legal action to mm -hmm. cure the title defect. But you have to make sure that's in there because the it's way not it's in written, the standard agreement. Yeah. And, and they, and they differ, they differ mm -hmm. from county to county. Like that, the, the, the standard contracts in one county might look different um, because they're adopted by a different realtor association mm -hmm. um, and the and the provisions could be very vastly different um, and, especially, and worse if this is for sale by owner then they're not even getting the most recent version because they're nabbing something that they found on google mm -hmm. we had one um maybe two or three years ago and it was a like 1995 florida realtors version of the contract which was a train wreck like that's not even close to usable but Right. That's what they can find and they want to just grab on to whatever's um, 
you know, good, fast, and cheap. They don't, they don't all go together. You either get fast and cheap or good and fast or cheap and <laughs> good, but it's, <laughs> it's not going to happen. Cheap and good doesn't go together. So you're not going to get all, all three. So. Agreed. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for, um, we had a lively, lively debate. Um, if you have questions, if you have questions about this topic, if you have other topics you'd like to hear about, if you'd like a referral to a really good realtor, we can help you with that too. So um, we, we work with lots of folks and see, um, we see lots of good, bad and ugly go down. So if you're contemplating involving yourself in a for sale by owner transaction, we are certainly not saying don't do it. We're saying don't do it unprepared. Um, it's, it's, it's crazy out there and it's, even crazier now with uh, the way everything is is shaken down. Um, we like to joke that, you know, in the wake of, of the pandemic, um, lots of commercials say we're all in this together. But when it comes time for these contracts, nobody is in this together. It's like the airlines. We're no, we're no longer in this together. So. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, thank you so much. If you have questions, let us know. We'll be happy to help. As always, you can find our recordings of our webinars on our Kuntz Associates and Kuntz Parkin websites, on our Facebook pages, on our YouTube channels. Um, so if you missed any part of this recording or would like to share, uh, you certainly have the opportunity to do so. We will return. We will be back with you um, next week on Tuesday, and we will um, we will be talking about rental properties and all of the fun that comes from both a legal and a tax consideration standpoint. Um, what to be concerned about if you are looking to invest in rental properties or already own some, uh, we can help you with that. So thanks so much, everyone. Have a great week. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.